Good evening, everybody. Welcome. My name is Sultan Rana, and I'm Sakana's course director at York University's Faculty of Education. Um, I am. Uh, I'm, I hail from York Region District School Board, where I'm on Sakana from, uh, where I served for nearly 15 years as a uh, in-class teacher from grades four to eight, a consultant, um, and as a school-wide support uh, educator. Um, uh, this year at the faculty, I serve as co-chair along with my partner, um, my co-lead, sorry, uh, Simon Chaudhry, who uh, we were kind of, um, we were graciously selected to, to co-chair and run this year's events. Um, so where the Faculty of Education Summer Institute has now become the year long bi-monthly Faculty of Education Summer Institute, uh, we have been uh, in the face of COVID-19, uh, turned what was once a two day conference to um, a year long webinar series. So uh, to all of those, all of those in uh, the YouTube world who are on YouTube live, chiming in with us right now, all 200 of you watching at this very moment, uh, we welcome you to our third in uh, our series, which is titled decolonizing mental health. Um, we really look forward to an invigorating conversation that will uh, happen within the YouTube live chat box. And um, please just know that our our panelists will not be privy to those conversations as we're kind of inoculated into uh, in a Zoom conversation that's being live streamed for you. So um, we, as always, we welcome a very invigorating conversation, a critical conversation. Um, these are topics that go against the status quo, that are not mainstream thinking. Um, and so there will be a great deal of agreements, disagreements, affirmations, questions, learning and unlearning. And with that tension, sometimes can be very critical conversations and we welcome that. But what we would like to bring to your attention is that we do reserve the right to um, exclude or remove someone from the chat box that is very clearly engaging in antagonizing conversation, antagonizing statements, um, identity-based uh, attacks um, or, or items that, that tread on hate speech, um, be it uh, ideas or um, personal attacks at any of our panelists or individuals in the chat box. So please do know that we looked to, to create a brave space, um, but unequivocally a safe space, no less. Um, for those of you that would like to take it on yourself and if anything occurs in the chat box that perturbs you or makes you feel un unsafe, know very well that if you log off um, out of for the sake of, of uh, clarity in your mental health, please know that we will have this recording open and ready for you following tonight's session, uh, where it will be separate from the chat box as well. Okay, so uh, with that said, uh, we, I welcome you tonight. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I would like to pass it on to my co-lead, Simon Chaudhry. Hello. Um, so as mentioned, uh, my name is Simon Chowdhury. I am seconded course director at the Faculty of Education at York University. My home board is Peel District School Board, where I had the privilege of serving in the capacity of what is called a climate for learning and working resource teacher. My portfolio was kindergarten to grade 12. Um, I also was a science department head, as well as a teacher of science, English, special education, student success, credit recovery. <laughs> Uh, so as Sultan mentioned, um, he and I are the co-chairs of FESI 2020. And on behalf of our team, including our faculty advisors, Dr. Vidya Shah, Dr. Carl James, as well as Superintendent Jack Negro from Durham District School Board and our amazing planning committee, we thank you sincerely for being with us tonight. It has always been the goal of this institution to disrupt and dismantle, to ask good questions, very necessary questions. To get into tr trouble, good trouble. Uh, to challenge institutions, to challenge policy makers. Um, to initiate real change that makes a difference for historically marginalized students. The problems that we discuss have been problems for too many years. The Institute has always invited educators to work alongside community partners and agencies, uh, recognizing that we are all better when we work together. Our speakers tonight will represent roles in educational leadership, in teaching, and in community. For over a decade, many district school boards have been partners in the support of this institute. 
This is critical in knowledge mobilization and to increase the likelihood that talks like this will transfer into action. We thank Toronto District School Board, Toronto Catholic District School Board, York Region District School Board, Peel District School Board, Dufferin Peel Catholic District School Board, Durham District School Board, Halton District School Board, Halton Catholic District School Board, Otto Carlton District School Board, and Kortha Pine Ridge District School Board for both their past and hopefully their ongoing support. As uh, before we move on forward, um, I would like to start by acknowledging the land. So we do recognize that many of us are tuning in for a variety of different um, places and spaces, and we would encourage you and invite you to take a mindful moment to think about the land acknowledgement that is best situated for your uh, place. Uh, given that we are broadcasting from York University, um, we are going to do land acknowledgement that is uh, situated to York University. So we recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the ter a traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tukaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As we acknowledge the land, I hope that we take moments to really internalize the meaning and the purpose of the land acknowledgement. For me to attribute personal meaning to the acknowledgement and to be mindfully reflective of its implications, um, its origins, its current context, um, has been something that I've been working on continuously. Today, when I think of the land, especially in the framework of tonight's webinar, I think of the wisdom of understanding that we are one with the land. From a colonial standpoint, we tend to speak of the environment and of nature as if it's like a separate entity from ourselves. Um, we place ourselves as humans, um, as if we are above the land in hierarchy. Whereas Indigenous wisdom would remind us that there is no separation and that we are supposed to have a reciprocal relationship with the land. The land sustains us, it nurtures us, it provides for us, and we too must nurture, provide, and sustain the land. This hierarchical viewpoint has allowed us to commodify the land and to seek to control it for personal purposes, often monetary and capitalistic in nature. We have severed relationships with the land based in respect, responsibility, and reciprocity. In her writing, A Yield of a Different Kind, uh, by Linda Hogan of the Chickasaw First Nation, uh, she states, there is a separation that has taken place between us and nature. Something has broken deep in the core of ourselves. Psychologist C.A. Meyer notes that as the wilderness has disappeared outside of us, it has gone to live inside the human mind. Because we are losing vast tracts of wilderness, we are not only losing a part of ourselves, but the threat to life, which once existed in the world around us, has now moved within. The whole of Western society, he says, is approaching a physical and mental breaking point. The result is a spiritual fragmentation that has accompanied our ecological destruction. I'd like to encourage all of us in our capacity as educators whether that's a formal title that you might hold in education or an informal title as a nurturer and caregiver who's modeling for younger generations to reflect on what the land acknowledgement means to us, has meant to us in our past, what it means to us in our current circumstances and what we would like it for, for it to mean for our future generations and how we can model this intentional acknowledgement and action towards reclamation of relationships with the land to support the well-being of all. I'd like to end by acknowledging the many Indigenous scholars whom I've been learning from through their writings and their publications, and to Dr. Alicia Moffat, who has been guiding me through my learning journey that's allowed me to provide some of the thoughts surrounding the land acknowledgement tonight. Before we move into our panel, we have the great honor of having with us tonight, Colleen Russell Rollins, to uh, bring greetings from the Peel District School Board. 
And she's very busy, but she's made time to be with us tonight. So thank you so much, Colleen, for being here. It's greatly appreciated. Um, Colleen Russell Rhines has recently named the Interim Permanent Director of the Peel District School Board, Canada's second largest school board. Over her 29 year career, Ms. Russell Rollins has held a variety of roles in education, including teacher, principal, consultant, and superintendent. As an associate director of the Toronto District School Board, her team had the responsibility for several aspects of TDSB's multi-year strategic action plans focused on ending various forms of streaming by improving early literacy and improving access to academic pathways in addition to responsibilities for professional learning in equity, anti-racism, and anti-oppression. Recently, she developed a proposal to establish the Center of Excellence for Black Student Achievement in TDSB, the first of its kind in Canada. She values the collaboration of working with staff, superintendents, trustees, and community. During her time, Ms. Russell Rollins has established respect respectful and trusting relationships with the Parent Involvement Committee and the Black Student Achievement Community Advisory Committee, where she served as staff lead. She has served on the board of directors, directors of Taibu uh, community agencies, as well as other community agencies. In 2018, she served as the president of the Ontario Supervisory Officers, Officers Association, and most recently was recognized as one of the 100 accomplished Black women in Canada of 2020. Please join me in welcoming Colleen Russell Rollins. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saima, and good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to be with you briefly this evening to offer some introductory remarks and then to rejoin you as a learner in this evening's conversation. And I'm very excited um, by this topic this afternoon. The topic of decolonizing mental health and well being is an area of great importance that has prompted, I think, further introspection, self-reflection, and continued learning for me both personally and professionally over the past few years. Uh, as you were speaking, Saima, it made me think about a quote that I read recently by Robin Wall Kamir, uh, who wrote Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants. And that quote is, the land knows you even when you are lost. And so tonight, as we talk about, uh, de as you talk about decolonizing uh, mental health, I think that that quote has um, particular resonance. Certainly in this time of crisis, where the spaces and communities in which we have traditionally found the resources to support our mental health and well being have shifted. For some, uh, it has uh, placed those resources further apart, while for others, those changes have allowed for greater investment in family and self-love. I'm keenly aware that many of us in our own ways are grappling with dual pandemics. The first obviously is COVID-19, the second is the long st longstanding and insidious impact of racism. Um, and in particular, I would name anti-Black racism, both of which are having a negative impact on communities and a disproportionate impact from the data on specific groups of students, staff, and families, especially in Peel Region and in Toronto. I will offer my comments this evening by way of a recent quote from a dialogue with a student, which I think exemplifies some of the emerging priorities for me as a director as we re-examine what it means to create mentally healthy spaces for students and communities. In a conversation with a grade 12 student where we were talking about some of her experiences of discrimination within the school and where she was engaging in some sense making and talking about how it has impacted her, she, she left me with this quote, I don't want to just survive, I want to thrive. And I know that that has been, been said before in many different spaces uh, by others, but it, 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 it struck me um, in that this quote positions at least two possibly more really important ideas. Firstly, for so long, well-meaning educators thought that the standard was to teach students how to survive discrimination in education and in the community. 
how to navigate unequal discipline, exclusion from experiences that they had the prerequisite skills and interests to participate in, uh, whether it was to navigate the questioning of their academic ability, how to respond to hate speech or microaggressions. Essentially, we were teaching our students, our Black, Indigenous, transgendered, Muslim, Jewish students, just as examples, um, how to navigate a system that promotes white supremacy as a sign of success rather than dismantling the very real barriers that existed for students individually and collectively and were having an impact on their sense of belonging and well-being. Developing resistance was seen as a rite of passage for many equity-seeking students. That must end. We will not fix the children. We will end the discrimination. Last year, Toronto Public Health declared anti-Black racism as a public health crisis. And, and um, for so many of us, we knew that in our bones, in our daily experiences. Um, but it was, I think, for many who, who don't have that lived experience, um, a, a real awakening to the impact of racism on the mental health of, of individuals. And we need to acknowledge that as school systems and not put that aside or and we need to take responsibility for that. To teach someone to endure it is normalizing it and it serves to perfect, perpetuate the system. And as I said, that must stop. Secondly, the quote also raises the expectation that in this student's words, that schools and communities have the potential to create the conditions for all students to thrive. It is their expectation when they walk through the door that the conditions of schools will allow them to become themselves and to become better versions of themselves because of what happens in our classrooms and in our schools. And we as educators have a duty to live up to those expectations. As a director, it's my goal that schools and classrooms focus on emotionally nurturing classroom spaces for young people. Classroom environments, the relationships within it, the resources, the structures, all contribute to or detract from students' well-being. One of the important factors is really understanding and respecting students' identities and lived experiences and the discriminatory or differential treatment that they may face. We should ask ourselves the questions, how are we identifying, naming, addressing, and eliminating individual acts of discrimination, and perhaps even more importantly, systemic inequities in our schools and classrooms? And what are the pedagogical approaches that ensure that students are heard when they speak their truth? It is my belief that we cannot talk about creating nurturing spaces and investing in well-being until we critically examine how we conceptualize our relationships with students and how we talk about behavior. The ministry report on the Peel District School Board mandates an examination of suspensions and expulsions. I would suggest that as educators for a long time, myself included, we probably used many coded terms that have either been misunderstood or misused, such as self-regulation and resilience, without critically examining how the environment can either protect or traumatize students and directly perpetuate the behaviors that students exhibit and then are suspended for. This critical analysis of how we see our relationships with students, how we see our power as educators is important in this discussion of supporting students' uh, mental health and well-being. The saliency of race, gender, sexuality, religion, and many other factors are, are critically important uh, to this dialogue and how we perceive mental health and our role in supporting each other's well-being. As a district, we're also on the path to co-creating with communities restorative justice practices that provide um, healing and dignity and reparations. And it is my belief that when used appropriately, this will be an investment in our collective well being as a community and as an educational community. Uh, in closing, I have to quote Audre Lorde, who wrote that uh, 
uh, a rallying cry that many of us quote, which is caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. That for me is an act of survival and revolution. I think the pandemics have taught us that there is uh, a role and a need often for a, what I will call loosely formalized mental health support. And for many, the counseling offered by regulated professionals has fallen short. And we know that we have to learn from community spaces, both through regulated health professionals who practice culturally responsive approaches, as well as uh, more indigenous ways of supporting mental health and well being as a district. And that we have to broaden how we provide supports and to learn with and from communities and to engage them in supporting students and families and to be vigilant in how we monitor the impact of formula, form, formalized and regulated care on Black and Indigenous families for far too long who have faced um, additional traumas through systems of care. For many of the participants this evening um, who hold uh, intersectional identities and who are faced with uh, the burdens of discrimination, I personally see you. I hope that that uh, quote by Audre Lorde gives you some sustenance and some support, and you have my commitment to continuing to evolve how we address um, uh, complaints that come forward in the Peel District School Board from our staff. Uh, we have some, we have tremendous work to do in that regard, but I'm I'm committed to moving forward with it. So I hope all members tonight will join me in examining our own belief systems and our behaviors and how we conceptualize mental health and well-being, and that we all strive to become more informed, supportive, anti-racist educators uh, that our students deserve. Thank you, and I look forward to rejoining the conversation. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much, Colleen. I know how we know how busy you are um, and um, you taking the time to come and be with us uh, to share your leadership vision, which is very clear, no wishy-washy. <laughs> um, and um, is, it's such an inspiration to hear you speak truthfully about um, the underlying systems and uh, the things that really do need to be spoken about. And we know that um, until things are acknowledged, we can't work on them to make them better. Um, and I think that uh, it's very inspirational and it shows your commitment and your vision um, for you to take the time to really be with us tonight to set us off and start us off on these conversations. And on behalf of uh, students and staff um, everywhere, not just in Peel, I'm biased because I'm here in Pia, but um, on behalf of everybody who's watching, um, I know that your words are going to be a source of hope and um, power for many of us. So thank you so much again for being with us tonight and starting us off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, with that, <laughs> we are going to move on to our panel tonight. I'm going to introduce our panelists um, in order of their speaking engagements. So I'm going to start first with Dr. Jennifer Mullen. Uh, Jennifer speak, uh, creates spaces for people and organizations to heal. She believes that it is essential to create dialogue to address how mental health is deeply affected by systemic inequities and the trauma of oppression, particularly the well being of queer, Indigenous, Black, Brown people of color. Dr. Mullen has earned her doctorate of psychology in clinical psychology from the California Institute of Integral Studies, a master's in counseling and community agencies from New York University's Steinhardt School of Education, and her bachelor's of arts in psychology and elementary education from New Jersey City University. She notes that her dissertation, love this, slavery and the inter intergenerational transmission of trauma in inner city African American male youth from cotton fields to the concrete jungle has been a primary foundation for her current work in furthering the decolonization discourse in mental health and particularly for therapists. As the founder and CEO of Decolonizing Therapy and most notably known as the content creator and educator for, Insta for Instagrams at Decolonizing Therapy, 
with a community of followers of over 125,000, Dr. Mullen and her team seek to dismantle and decolonize systems of oppression, beginning with the mental health industrial complex. Decolonizing therapy offers workshops, keynotes, educational discussions, and, ret and retreats that help the practitioner to unpack and become curious about the systems in which they've become educated and the ways in which they have be become socialized. Currently, Dr. Mullen is a full-time psychologist at New Jersey City's University's Counseling Center, facilitator of the campus LGBTQIA plus support group, coordinator of the university's nationally recognized peer education program, Peers Educating Peers, um, instructor of graduate counseling courses, and a proud LGBTQIA plus Gothic Night Ally Safe Zone trainer. She is passionately committed to solidarity work that effectively addresses inequities based on race, gender, class, ability, gender identity, and sexual orientation. Her professional research and clinical interests include complex and intergenerational trauma, group psychotherapy, LGBTQIA plus wellness, spirituality and mindfulness practices, racism as trauma, healing in therapeutic settings, self-love as a revolutionary act, and the process of decolonizing mental health. She loves spending time at the ocean, being a tourist in her backyard of New York City, Zumba, and spending time with her loved ones, including her cat, Isis. <laughs> Thank you so much, despite all that going on, for uh, you've taken time to be with us tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Mullen. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Cheryl Wolno. Cheryl has been teaching for several years around the world. She has taught in the UK, the Caribbean, Asia, and now here in Canada with the Peel District School Board. She has taught several grades and secured leadership positions over the years. Currently, Cheryl is an educator with the Peel District School Board, working with a wonderful bunch of curious and beautiful minds. Outside of her work hours, Cheryl supports a high school boys group as a teacher mentor within the Peel District School Board. She also collaborates with Peel teachers at her local ETFO union known as AREC, the union's anti-racism and equity committee, focusing on issues related to anti-racism, anti-oppressive practices, equity, and inclusion. Cheryl also provides professional and social development for parents, students, and staff via workshops and presentations within the school board and the wider community. In addition to these items, Cheryl is a board member of the Ontario Alliance of Black School Educators, ANABSI, where she is an active and enthusiastic member in charge of the Mental Health and Wellbeing Commission. Cheryl is an advocate and community activist who is passionate about the success of Black and marginalized students, firmly believing that all children can succeed with time, care, patience, and careful programming through a race equity lens. At home, Cheryl loves cooking and creating a variety of international dishes for her family and friends. More than anything, she loves spending time with her children, family, and friends in order to create beautiful memories. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for joining us tonight. And I hope that tonight you'll be creating some more beautiful memories with us. <laughs> okay, so with our panelists introduced, we're just gonna make maximum use of our time. So we're just gonna start off with um, Dr. Mellon, I have a question for you. Uh, what does it mean to decolonize mental health? Mm, it's a beautiful question. <laughs> um, well, where I would start in decolonizing mental health is first looking at the ways in which we have been conditioned um, to believe that wellness occurs and in what pockets, what places, and what spaces. Um, so one of the things that comes up for me when I think of decolonization, right, is the undoing process. Um, and, and that is not something that many of us are taught in schools, right? You're taught how to pathologize, essentially. You're taught how to diagnose. You're taught how to treat. We're not taught how to heal or how to bring healing into classrooms, into therapeutic containers, 
or into our places and spaces where we are advocates. Yeah. Um, so when I think of decolonization of mental health, I think of a holding systems of care accountable, right? Without holding systems of care accountable, we continue to recreate and replicate um, the same harm, particularly on indigenous black brown bodies. Um, so part of the decolonization process is also being a critical lover and being willing to unpack, undo and dismantle a great deal of the trauma that we have endured historically um, and um, for people that are white bodied um, to look at the ways in which they have to take accountability and to do more work to begin to undo um, and how should I say this, unzip, right? This, this cloak of, of white privilege, right? And we're not just talking white privilege within like the, the, the skin tone of it, but also the privilege that comes with being assumed that um, white is right in theory, in praxis, in research. Um, I was just sitting in a meeting just to exemplify this maybe about a week or two ago, virtually of course. Um, and um, a colleague that, that I respect very much and she gave me consent to completely bring this up. <laughs> you know, it is like has read all the right books and is all like Robin DiAngelo, you know, like white guilted and white theory, you know, has, knows, understands it. And when it came to looking at particular students, which we were working with and particular cases in which students would require um, extended session time or um, extended time to be able to come in a little bit later because they were dropping off their children to childcare or they didn't have enough bus money or whatever, I could see the stop, the rigidity, right? The place and the space of, well, well these are the rules. And we have to follow our rules. And I immediately looked at her like, mm -hmm. and we also have to look at why some of these rules are in place in the first place, right? Why do we have, we have these rules? So I think some questions related to decolonizing mental health is like, whose theories are we honoring? Whose voices are we honoring? Um, who is not in the room? Right, not even just physically, but whose presence, who, um, whose needs are not being accounted for, whose voices are being continuously um, stifled and silenced, consciously or not, for the betterment of you know late stage capitalism and white supremacy. Um, so I think it's really important for us to begin to look at the ways also that our histories of colonization come to continue to be landing in our bodies and um, make us unwell, you know, create inflammation and dis-ease in our bodies. And many, many doctors and research researchers have supported to the ways in which, as we know, trauma causes inflammation in the body, right? Trauma continuously leads to this um, kind of overactivated, yeah, nervous system, right? This fight, flight, freeze, fawn response, which I think a lot of us are becoming more attuned to. But are we considering this? I think we are, right? And if you're here, likely you are, but you know, on a larger global level, are we looking at how colonization has affected and been passed down and transmitted intergenerationally, right? Epigenetically and through role modeling, attachment, I can keep going on. How has that come to land in our bodies and more important in the bodies of the youth in which you're teaching, treating, working with, loving, raising. Um, so I think a lot of us often feel this like disconnect with our historical trauma. Um, and, and I think that that is where we are bringing it back um, as was being said before to the land, you know, to our people, to our original ways of doing things. So decolonizing therapy is about reclaiming right? Reintegrating. It is about bringing it back and reviving, recording. So with the decolonization process that needs to happen individually first, right? We, we, we need to begin to unwrap. It's sort of like the serpent. I'd like to see it as a serpent. I tell this to my students all the time, like the process of oppression and colonization and white bodied supremacy continues to play out in all of our minds, including myself, right? <laughs> and it is a daily practice to, and it gets easier, 
you know, it's a muscle, it, but it's a daily practice in sort of uncoiling it around the way that we see things that we've all been collectively socialized in my humble opinion, unless you've really lived from the land and from the people and the people's teachings. But otherwise, we have continued to be bound up in this terribly Eurocentric way of seeing things without questioning how this continues to impact the people receiving these services, um, right? So um, as an example, right, although I might not be sitting in session saying, okay, so that's intergenerational trauma, let's talk about that. Usually people that I'm serving and working with are coming in saying, you know, I, I'm just so exhausted. I feel like my professor doesn't hear me. I keep trying to explain A, B, C, and D. I have a letter from the Office of Specialized Services saying I'm struggling with trauma. You know, I'm the only caregiver in my home. My mother is disabled. I'm taking my little brother to school. I'm a DACA recipient. Most of them are undocumented, right? So I'm hearing this constantly, constantly, constantly. And yet frequently what will happen is if, again, if you're not coming from a more conscious, politicized, decolonized frame, whether as a teacher, as a therapist, as a healthcare worker, it's so easy to miss it, yeah? It's so easy to let that moment pass rather than reminding the individual you're serving or the community or the group that Wait, this isn't just about you. You know, like you're not the problem, right? We're also residing in environments and systems and societies that benefit from you thinking that you're lazy and you're the problem. So I take these moments to educate the people that I serve. Um, and I don't make it about me. It's not about Jennifer, right? but I make it about like, well, you know, where did you learn that? You know, and where did you learn this? And who told you that you need to work harder? Who told you that you're being lazy? Um, where does lazy, where does it show up in your body? Who does this remind you of in your life? And usually what comes up, oh, well, you know, my mom just worked nonstop three, four jobs. Oh, my dad is still back in our country and we can't bring him up. Yes. So how has forced migration affected our people, right? How has colonization come in and affected our lands, forcing us to separate from our families of systems. Many of us forcing us to come to the country is not all that we're in now. Um, the other piece I want to point out is that decolonization is very much not a metaphor. I, I mean, for me, and I know Tuck and Yang, um, there's, there's a great article um, around decolonization not being a metaphor. And I would agree completely and totally. Although I have sort of a, so to speak, expertise in the emotional decolonization process. But I think it's important for us to look at the ways in which mental health began. Where did we start, right? And, and mental health or treating the human with some form of imbalance or dis-ease began with very spiritual ancestral roots. Right? It began with our curanderas and our shamans and our witch doctors of our communities, right? Like trying to take the, the heaviness or the darkness or the heavy spirit out of the body using nature and forms of nature as a way to reclaim and recenter. And so that is why I think many of us doing this decolonial work are not only trying to hold systems of oppression accountable, <laughs> right? We're, we're, we're holding and we're looking at how the prison industrial complex intersects with the healthcare system, how that intersects with the education system, right? How that intersects with mental health. And, and we can keep going on in our transportation system, we could keep going and how it continues to benefit many white bodied individuals, particularly upper class, middle class, people with money as we know, and continues to not properly impact in the way that we want those that are at or below the poverty line. Yeah, um, and so frankly, I am, I really feel that the decolonization of mental health and therapy is a battle cry. Yeah, it, you know, it's a battle cry that we, we're tired of attending our youth's funerals. Yeah, like we're tired, I'm tired. I, you know, I go and I have to speak personally because I think that it's important to connect to this work. You know, we don't do decolonization work and just stay in an ivory tower. That would be the antithesis. Yeah, that, that would be like the absolute worst case scenario. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, part of this work is about returning to our land, our people, our culture, and to humanize 
those of us who have been dehumanized to humanize, right? The black body, what was, we were just speaking about, right? That anti-black racism permeates everywhere throughout Central America, throughout South America, throughout South Asia, throughout, we can keep going, it's everywhere, right? And in that way, we're so accustomed to demonizing, dehumanizing, pathologizing the black body. Right. And, and we, I saw this in my, my my country with the murders of George Floyd and Amar Arbery and Breonna Taylor and Mike Brown and Sandra Bland. And we can keep going and we can keep going to countries, cities all across the world in which we have been told over and over that it's not safe. It's not safe. And if we're not safe and we're feeling internally, unconsciously even not safe. What is that then transmitting to the little ones? What is that transmitting, right? To, to our teenagers, to our two-year-olds who can very much understand and read, right? I'm so Cheryl can identify and you see my, like, I, I, like we can really, really begin to realize that our children pick up cues from us, right? We know this, we know that they pick up the nonverbal. And so as a psychologist, my job is to say, hmm, you know, I love my field but I'm a critical lover. I've learned to become a critical lover. And that means saying, hey, yeah, therapy, the way that we've been taught may work for some people or it may work for a year, year and a half, according to many of my students of color. Like it's good, but when we don't begin to bring parts of ourselves into it as teachers, as therapists, as healthcare workers, if we continue to put up this sort of like big glass, I don't even know what to call it, sort of obscuring curtain, over part of our personality, who we are, what we believe, even I would dare say our political leanings as, as scary as that might be, you know, then we don't have a right to say that we're in the practice of trying to decolonize anything, right? If we're not willing to also fully show up and fully help people understand that we are living and growing these youth, growing them up in a very sick system. Right, and as long as we're in this very sick system, um, how can we fully be well, right? So it's like I'm running in a rat circle. I'm over here trying to help people and heal them and treat them. But meanwhile, we're in a society that continues to benefit off of their lack of well-being and off of their deaths. Um, so for me, decolonizing therapy is about the reclamation is about the returning to the indigenous, to the land, to our nativeness, to our Africanness, to our, you know, to our blackness, to all of it. It is bringing it back and also holding these systems accountable and acknowledging the historical grief and trauma that um, has continued to be passed down in our bodies. Um, and there's other, one other piece I want to say. You know, the decolonization process is also about um, calling each other in a lot more. And I think that that is something that does not frequently happen in a lot of our spaces um, because it's unsafe. Yeah, what happens when we step outside and we stand up for a youth or a family member, or, you know, we, we get popped right back down, right? You, you either don't get transferred to the grade you want or, you know, suddenly you're transferred to another school with a stricter system, uh, <laughs> you know, anytime we ask too many questions, we've learned that we're going to get in trouble, right? We're going to get in trouble. And with that, I would say, well, my mental health system's already in trouble living in these systems, right? Our youth are in trouble. They're consistently being over pathologized and targeted for simply being. Anger is over pathologized right? Um, their trauma symptoms are over pathologized. So I would say to that, that that process is moving away from individualism, that decolonizing, that reclaiming and getting closer to what might collective work look like in our school systems? What might collective healing look like amongst a group of teachers or a group of therapists or a group of school nurses? What might really bringing healing back in require? And, and I might say that that might require being a critical lover and really looking at pedagogy and theory, you know, and, and, and again, I could, it's, I could speak for psychology and social work and counseling and saying, there are some great, wonderful things about psychotherapy and psychoanalytic work and CBT, 
But these theories that we've been ingrained and like brainwashed with are predominantly older, cisgendered, heterosexual white males, right? It's their theories that we continue to be teaching our schools and our children and our, and our counselors, right? And we wonder why counselors are just burned out, burned out consistently. Um, so th I know this is a very long answer, but <laughs> I just, <laughs> but I wanted to say like, yeah, you know, why are our children sick? Why are we not well? And, and, and I wanna say that it's, it's not us and I'm tired of it being about us right, individual, rather than looking at the systems that continue to poison the water that our babies drink from. We must hold them accountable. Wow, wow, so much to say <laughs> as a follow-up. Um, I mean, thank you uh, for that. So much for us to think about um, in terms of community identity uh, what we're told about identities that don't differ from European identities. Um, I think many of us, we, because, you know, a lot of us are here because we have been socialized within the system. So even though we may look the way that we look, we still have all that internalization going on. And that's why we're here, right? I mean, these are things that we need to think about. And um, the power that you speak about in terms of, you know, really, I've engaged in these conversations where people will say, well, has anybody ever said anything to you about like, you're not allowed to say certain things? Like, how do you know you're not allowed to say that? And I didn't really have an answer. And I think that many of us just know that we know because we're socialized into it. It's all of those microaggressions that Colleen was referring to earlier. It's all of these, um, you know, things that are said and not said um, that really tell us, you know, know your place, behave a certain way and be like us, right? I mean, there's all this stuff that's going on. And I certainly have been on a personal journey a lot about thinking about decolonizing mental health and uh, emotional labors that our students feel and um, really thinking about what was my personal journey growing up and how have I been socialized and how am I complicit in these systems, recreating these systems? Is, is this really something that I value, that my culture values? Or is this something that I'm just recreating because that's how I've been socialized? And I think we all need to take that pause, you've mentioned it, and really think about that calling in and thinking about how we are really complicit in these systems because they're perpetuating because of us. <laughs> if we're part of the system, then, you know, <laughs> it's gotta, somebody's gotta take that responsibility and it has to be each and every single one of us, absolutely. You, you touched on it a bit, um, Jennifer, about the idea of like the, in, the inflammation. And we know that, for example, black women, um, the, the shortened life expectancies. Um, a lot of the time we hear about a lot of our equity leaders and boards and different organizations um, having to take leave, like extended medical leave, because they're just, they're just burnt out. There's nothing left to give mm -hmm. because you're giving all that you can. Mm -hmm. You're seen as a sign of hope and you keep giving. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, but there's nothing filling you back up because the systems just keep holding you down. I'm just wondering, um, what have you seen from your experiences about um, other impacts on, on racialized and minoritized students? What do you see in, in your work? Yeah, great, beautiful question. Um, well, I think that some, you know, my response would be like, what are we not seeing that doesn't continue to sort of make my stomach hurt on a consistent basis? Um, I think that uh, well, you know, the word I, I'm so I'm such a big person when it comes to like language, right? Because I, I think that language has the capacity to help us liberate, but it, it is so um, also dangerous with the way that it can be utilized, like the word minority. Like when I hear my youth be identified as minorities, I'm like, no, there's nothing minor about you. You're not you're not a minority, right? right? And, and so um, I start thinking about the ways that we classify yeah, classification systems. Um, I know that in the, in the US, um, what's really big are these like no child left behind classrooms and they're integrating with like special ed. But in reality, what happens in many of our classrooms are that there's more labeling and pathologizing, particularly of youth. Um, and they can have high GPAs or high grades or be super emotionally intelligent. But what matters is, oh wait, they're out of line. 
Um, their voice is a little too loud. Um, they're raging. Well, you know, and then some of us would come in and say, well, of course they're raging. Such and such is happening in their home. Uh, father was just deported back to Kenya. Mother just this, like, of course they're raging. This is what's happening. Um, so what I often notice is um, a lot of what Dr. Joy DeGru Leary talks about in post-traumatic slave syndrome when it comes to black bodied youth, which is like this more vacant self-esteem, this sense of just like learned hopelessness and helplessness, a feeling as though no one is gonna see me anyway, so F it, I don't care, right? Um, uh, flat affect sometimes when it comes to violence in and around them, right? Because we're so desensitized. We become so used to a consistent state of violence and or being used to people seeing us as violent, even if we are not being violent at all, right? So um, I remember being in school and teachers consistently saying like, Jennifer talks too much and Jennifer, ha ha ha, right? Like you wouldn't have guessed that, but you know, Jennifer, the, you know, too much, too much aggression, too much this, like, in other words, get her back in her place, mm -hmm. right? Like get her back in her place. And that's where I believe there's this unconscious thread and belief that white is right that everything that it is that we do, every measurement, although I hate it, every measurement is based off of whiteness, right? In terms of how students should act, how they learn, <laughs> whether or not they could be moving while they're learning, um, how their bodies need to engage when they're in this hormonal, right, pubescent period, um, as well as the ways that we continue to punish them, even though we're, we may be calling it consequence. We know through research that um, darker skinned students are, are getting punishments that then send them into the school to prison nexus pipeline, which we know is a, is a deal breaker and can be a family breaker and a life breaker and continues to impede generations, seven generations after them. Um, I would also dare say, and I wrote this down because I did not want to forget it, that in the US 1.7 million students are in schools with cops and no counselors, yeah? 1.7 million students when I first and 3 million students are in schools with cops and no nurses. Okay, and we can keep going, but these numbers are staggering. And where we see these cops, right, are in these places and spaces that are seen as like the inner city, right? Mm -hmm. Or where we, where we see violence in the communities. Um, but what this also points out to me is this setting up our students to get kind of desensitized to law enforcement in and around them all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and it desensitizes the teachers um, consciously or not. It could be unconsciously, right? Um, no shade, but to this, to this belief that when students are in trouble, that they're kind of like expendable, disposable, and that, you know, you need to listen to me and you need to listen to me like this. And I think that that's super punitive. Some of the other ways that I, I see um, many people of color, particularly black and brown identified people, indigenous people um, deeply affected by these systems are by our psychiatry, right? By the way that the psychiatry movement continues to impede people's well being. Um, you know, there's many cultural bound diseases or uh, illnesses, so to speak, mental health issues and symptoms. But yet quickly, we are taught in psychiatry to medicate. We are quickly taught to like bring somebody in line, put the corral them rather, get them to follow instructions and then just keep moving as if nothing's happened. But there's grief involved in receiving a mental health diagnosis. Yeah, like there's grief involved in your child receiving a diagnosis of a learning disability or, or, or learning and um, reading differently than other children or Asperger's or, uh, you know, um, autism. There's some grief in that. And, and I think that there is we, we're not slowing down enough. We're still in this very individualistic, as I said before, late stage capitalism perspective where we just have to like grieve and go grieve and go, right? And we, we still have to function. So as you were saying, and, and part of your question, it's part of capitalism fatigue, in my humble opinion. You know, um, I don't know if there's really imposter syndrome as much as there is 
white bodied supremacy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there's really um, just burnout and I don't want to minimize it because I've had it myself in my life <laughs> and I've had to take six weeks off because yes, here we are continuing to do what we've done on the very plantations and where we were stolen and brought, right? To continue to take care of everyone's children, everybody's needs, placing our needs on the back burner. And frankly, all the time. Yes, Cheryl, all the time. And frankly, I think a form of healthy reparation would be to let Black folks effing rest, right? <laughs> right? Like rest is revolutionary. Yeah. And, 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 and not just in the form of, map, of naps, right? Although a nap would be great. I don't know the last time I had a nap, right? <laughs> but rest in the form of not working as many hours, you know, friends being conscious of the emotional labor that they're placing on us right? Our employers being conscious of what they're asking of us, you know, answering emails after hours, right? Being of the support to everyone, being the mammy, although no one is saying it, it is unconsciously being passed down. So to me, I think that a lot of what has happened is that Blackness, particularly Black femmes and women identified people continue to be the big, large, teat, <laughs> milking everybody, um, and yet feeling guilty for taking mental health days for ourselves and um, feeling guilty, yeah, for, um, you know, stepping back, as Colleen was saying, and, and taking care of ourselves. As Audre Lorde mentioned, you know, it is revolutionary for Black and Brown and Indigenous folks to begin to slow down, take care of themselves, take sabbaticals. Teachers deserve sabbaticals, yeah? Therapists deserve sabbaticals, not just professors at a university level. And again, these are the ways that I believe anyway, um, that we must begin to decolonize academia, our school systems, our school boards. It's not working. It's not working. These individualistic, competitive, these are forms of internalized white supremacy. Yeah, and these are things that we've all internalized, including myself. Um, so yeah, just as a reminder, I think that um, also it brings us to the ancestral piece, right? Um, a lot of times our religions or spiritualities or ways of honoring and being with earth and spirit are also pathologized, are also seen as a problem, are not honored and respected. So I tell my students all the time, they're like, no, 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 how is such and such religion, you know, um, a privilege? And I said, well, you automatically get days off when you're that religion to honor your high holy days. Do Muslims automatically get paid and get those high holy days respected, right? What about those of us in Santeria? What about that? Like, so it helps people to understand where are the points of privilege? Where are the points of oppression? And where can we begin weaving and threading and filling these gaps up so that we can live and thrive and, and not have shorter life expectancies? Like, I know that us, us here, we, we want to have a retirement, right? <laughs> right? And we want to live in a way now, right? Like as I, as I create my business, I'm saying to myself, how can I live now where I don't have to like wait for a, a vacation? How can I create a life now that would allow me to role model this healthiness to the people that I'm serving to set limits and to say, I'm no longer going to take abuse from these systems, how do we do this and how do we begin to role model this? I have more questions, more than I do answers. <laughs> but I think that's part of the decolonization process is asking harder questions um, rather than needing to know answers that we have to live our way into. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about so much as you speak. Um, and part of it is... Um, the modeling, right? There's, we can say to our children, be proud of who you are. You have the right to a safe space, but do we model that for them? Or do we continue to take the abuse that some, some of us do face when we are speaking up about differences? Are we gaslit into thinking from other people saying, you know, hold on a second, are you just being sensitive about that? Or is that something that's really there? Or I can understand why that's important to you because you know that would impact your identity. And it's like, well, hold on a second. When I spoke up for everybody else's identity, 
you didn't think I was being sensitive then, right? So there, there might be some authenticity to what I'm saying, but at the same time, you know, you don't necessarily verbalize that. A lot of the time we take that home and we think about it and we think about why was I not able to say what I needed to say in that moment to preserve myself. Um, I think it's interesting that you speak about the idea that, you know, we're put in these positions where, where we have to take care of everybody else. And it's true. I've been in situations where, um, and I've heard this from many of my racialized uh, female in particular identifying colleagues, where, you know, we're told, you know, yes, that was a very horrible situation that happened to you, but you're a strong woman and you're going to get through this. And my sister, who's my baby sister, but she's a lawyer, but she's my baby sister. But she said to me um, one time when I said, spoke to her about this, she said, yeah, you're a damn strong woman. And that doesn't absolve your workplace employer for taking responsibility to create that safe space for you. You have the right to a safe space, just like anybody else. So we take, you know, we, we are put in these situations, we speak up, we're gaslit into thinking there's something wrong with our way of thinking, be grateful for what you have, and you were wrong to speak up. And then, you know, a, we're abused. And then we're told that, you know, you're, but you're strong, that was wrong, but you're strong, and you're going to get through this. And our children see this, they see it. And so, I mean, it, it's, it's, again, that cycle, right? How do we break that cycle? And how do we make it so that our children don't have that emotional labor that they're carrying that is not understood by dominant groups? If you live in an dominant identity, I wish you could understand when we hear our children speak, what they say to us about the pain that they carry and the fact that they don't even feel that they can verbalize it within their spaces to adults that are supposed to be caring for them, who are paid to care for them, who have a moral and legal obligation to care for them, right? Yes. So, yes. Cheryl, um, you, you had the opportunity to moderate a panel uh, through NUBSI this summer on uh, mental health and well-being and um, the colonial impact on, on Black students in particular. Yeah. Given that you're Ontario-based, um, in hearing, being very much part of this conversation, active within the community, active within these conversations. What are you hearing from an, an Ontario perspective? So before I start, I just want us to have a brief moment of silence um, for Jamal Francique, DeAndre Campbell, and Ijaz Chowdhury, all three from the region of Peel in which I work, all three murdered by Peel police while they were in crisis a mental health crisis. So um, mem um, memories go to them and our thoughts, prayers to their families too. Thank you. So I'll move on with that. Jennifer, amazing, thank you. So what we found um, is that COVID is another layer of stress and trauma, um, you know, within the black African and Caribbean communities. We already know how deeply embedded uh, anti-black racism is. Um, not just in um, education, but in every sector of society, including uh, the healthcare sector. And we just have to go back and look in history that enslaved black, uh, Africans were used like animals, you know, uh, to experiment on, you know, via, you know, doctors who used our enslaved ancestors as experimental tools. And hence the fact, you know, we weren't seen as humans, and to this day, we are still dehumanized alongside our indigenous uh, brothers and sisters. You know, we have to look back in history to know that Canada, Canada is a settler colony. You know, we have a deep, dark, insidious history of ind indigenous genocide and slavery. And a lot of people outside of Canada, as well as in Canada, aren't, you know, are not aware um, that Canada had approximately 206 years of slavery. Um, you know, the, the notion, the, the romantic notion of the underground railroad does not exist because they came up here seeking freedom to be enslaved and treated the same way um, as they were in, this, in the United States. Um, yes, we are like America, very much like America. It's just that Canada unleashes white supremacy with a smile while killing your soul in the process. Oh, and it, and it continues. And for our non-Canadian um, viewers who do not 
use the term anti-black racism, I'll give a brief definition and term coined by Afua Benjamin, a retired professor at Ryerson University. And this definition can be found on the Black Health Alliance website. And it states, anti-black racism is defined here as policies and practices rooted in Canadian institutions such as education, healthcare and justice that mirror and reinforce beliefs, attitudes and prejudice, stereotyping and or discrimination towards people of black African descent. So um, anti-black racism is a pandemic. It's, it's a pandemic that is centuries years old and continues today and it manifests in our bodies. You know, as Dr. Mullen mentioned, you know, Jennifer mentioned it manifests in our bodies uh, in different ways. Um, we, we know that there's a high incidence of high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, stress, even memory loss, you know, sometimes forgetfulness that is automatically assumed that you don't know your job, you don't know what you're doing. And then, you know, you will find that those with deep rooted racist minds will use that as a tool to try and discredit you as a professional. You know, we can see the disparities within the Black African and Caribbean communities. And as it as it's, is in education, and we know that COVID-19 has in, impacted our Black African and Caribbean communities. And many are frontline workers and live in underserved communities where community resources are often inaccessible or limited. And that impacts our students each and every day as they walk into the classrooms. Do they have enough food? Um, you know, are, are families sick? You know, um, you know I, I knew of a family where mothers raising three beautiful girls and she caught COVID and, you know, and the fear, you know, of COVID. And I know other members that caught um, COVID but were frightened to go to the hospital um, because of the fear of how they'd be treated. And then you hear, uh, that, you know, and see the data that it's our black uh, and, and um, you know, brown communities that are impacted the most. I'll give a brief example. I cut my finger, gashed it very deeply during COVID to the extent that it really needed stitches. I, I'm an ex-nurse, it really needed stitches. And my son was like, mom, I think you might need to go. I said, there's no way I'm touching that hospital door. I really wasn't. And I bled and bled and bled and bled. And I basically got the home remedies, you know, to bandage up the finger. But that cut took nearly two and a half weeks to heal and seal because I didn't want to go to the hospital um, based on how I know as an ex-nurse how the hospital and healthcare system operates. And that's one of the reasons why I left. So, you know, parents are stressed, you know, balancing work and supporting their children. And, you know, we've heard of par parents working long hours and relying on precarious work, which results in unstable incomes. You know, and this has a huge impact on the household where, you know, parents have to put food on the table and keep a roof over their heads, you know, uh, you know, so that's important, you know, as opposed to a new device that they might need for learning or the internet, which they may, you know, so it, it's a toss up between food on the table, roof over our heads or educational resources that are highly expensive and they can't afford. So, you know, so we have that factor, you know, and also too with the fact that online learning with our students that we need to look at our students holistically and, and teach from, you know, I, I love to teach from a multiple intelligence stance where I see a, a kid that's musical, let's get some music on there. A, a child that's physical, let's get movement on. A child that's visual. That you, so in that space, that's how I incorporate. But how do you do that when you're an online students stuck in front of a screen all day, which we know that you know, online screen time has an effect on the brain uh, and, you know, overactive brains and sensitivity, especially if students do have or are diagnosed with ADHD on that online screen time, sitting constantly all day is not healthy. It's not where we are from. We, we are from the land of movement. We are from Africa, moving out in the sun and teaching. I remember when I was teaching in the, in the Caribbean, I was there for five years. I would take my class out under the almond tree and we would teach, we'd go to the mango tree and pick the mangoes. You know, I had that beautiful opportunity of just moving around and, and connecting with the land in the beautiful sunshine. So they're unable to do that. They're stuck in front of a device all day, literally. And many parents don't have access to printers. While printers and, and ink, while printers may be cheaper today, the ink often costs more than the actual printer. 
And then, the, you know, you buy that cartridge of ink that's very expensive and you're lucky if you get 20 sheets out of that. So, you know, school boards have been diligent in distributing devices, but we have to also look at children with multiple siblings. If, you know, one device per family, what happens if there's a family with four or five children? How does that work? And also finding out too, a mother told me that while one, she was using one device, her phone was being used all day. So she didn't really have access to her phone and her phone burnt out. So, you know, also too, um, stories of uh, a family literally going to a school car park with a child and the device to connect to the internet from the school or going to uh, the local Tim's, the coffee shops where you can get free access within there, but sitting out in the car in the car park to access that. And that is the reality of our marginalized students. You know, another layer of frustration of, you know, parents returning from home after a long day to support assignments and homework with subject areas that they have limited or no knowledge with. You know, I remember years ago uh, when my daughter was in grade 10 and she needed some support around chemistry, just a, a portion of her chemistry work she wasn't quite understanding. And I had no clue this is grade 10 chemistry. The last time I did chemistry was high school when I was preparing to go to nursing school. You know, so, you know, we have to look at those pieces that, are, that fail our children. You know, so while school boards also are looking at anti-black racism, especially with our amazing new director, Colleen Russell Rawlings, um, you know, anti-black racism still impacts the education system, you know, and boards are offering PD sessions, teaching and learning support, you know, as well as revamping some policies. However, we've, we've yet to see how that's really unfolding and trickling down within the systems around us. You know, and parents are seeing that teachers are not addressing anti-black racism as directed, especially online. And many parents are here, you know, are wondering, and I wonder myself too, I'll be honest, that, you know, are we using the pandemic as an excuse not to get real, the real job of anti-black racism, anti-indigenous racism, you know, kicked out so we can start having anti-racist practices within our school boards. And we also have to remember too, we have approx approximately 80% of Ontario teachers are white. You know, uh, my school board, approximately 79% of the staff is white. 83% are racialized. We have less than 10% black teachers. Hence my t-shirt, Black Teachers Matter. Uh, and that's the logo on my peel board um, mail. You know, so, you know, all of those things we have to take into consideration and we know implicit bias continues in our classrooms each and every day from teachers around us and to the leaders around us very much so um, what what you know came to mind was free economics um, the book by Stephen um, Dubner and he chapter six is usually my go-to chapter and that chapter basically highlights severe bias um, that we have around us that takes place around us regarding non-anglo-saxon names um, you know, and the bias that takes place before even meeting um, potential employment candidates, you know, looking at the names and discarding um, the applications. And this still plays out today in classrooms, um, you know, with regards to racial bias in our classrooms and in the hiring practices, you know, and based upon hiring practices and the lack of diverse hiring, um, you know, to reflect the student body, you know, we don't have enough black and indigenous teachers. You know, you know, we are always looked upon and pushed aside. We don't see enough and we need to have children that see themselves in the classroom to help boost their self-esteem, to know that I can be aspire to be a teacher. And, and that teacher can then aspire them to go on to greater things such as higher education. But when you have a teacher with bias, their mindset, and, and it's told to me, Cheryl, you're not going to amount to anything. Um, you know, don't bother, go to university and so forth. And I'm like, you don't even know me. This was the first week I started in her class and I'm like I'm going to prove you wrong lady and I did you know so you know but not every child is going to turn that around because it's the self-fulfilling prophecy that that falls into place when they're seen and told that they're you know they're not reflected in in the school in the school environment you're basically telling that child that they're not important you know you're showing that child from your classroom and school environment that doesn't reflect them that they're not important and and even when I was a resource teacher going into schools before the education cuts, 
the first thing that I would do before going into the office, I'd go I'd deliberately go early, use a washroom, and then I would deliberately go and look at the staff photograph. And that would inform me of the building that I would be working with. And that would inform me of how I would navigate that building. You know, so back to the hiring practices, um, Narcissy.com um, uh, has an article and the article is published uh, titled Canada ranked as one of the top countries for racial discrimination in the hiring process. Canada the land of opportunities and multiculturalism. That was the article that recently came out. You know, so that in itself informs why our school boards are the way they are and why other areas and sectors within the society are the way they are because we are not valued. So, you know, for us to move forward, we need our co-conspirators. I don't like using the word allies, it's too soft. We need you to be a co-conspirator to work with us and to disrupt with us. If you have privilege, use it, don't abuse it. Use that privilege to help shift change, to change policies and, and to really make sure that we can start dismantling anti-black racism because right now, <clears throat> excuse me, we're working in pockets because there are not enough of us. We need more to join and genuinely join, not just joining to fluff your portfolio, not just joining to add to your resume for promotion, because we generally see that happen. And then they move into positions, racialized people too, move into positions of leadership and do nothing. And that is very sad indeed. And I'll, I'll leave it there. So thank you. Wow, Cheryl, lots and lots for us to take away from that. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you've done a really amazing job of portraying the realities of what many of our students are living in, many of our educators are living in. Um, and really, you know, as you're speaking, as both of you have been talking, I've really been thinking about the idea of when we talk about decolonizing, the Eurocentric idea that, you know, pathologizing and medicating and work individually, whereas many cultures seek solace from community um, and, and support in community. And, you know, my mom's friend and uncle, you know, I remember growing up, everyone's like, you have so many aunties. And I'm like, well, yeah, they're not really, I was kind of embarrassed. I'm like, they're not really my aunties. They're just like, I just call them my aunties. And everyone's like, what's wrong with you? Why would you call them your aunties if they're not your aunties? And I'm like, uh, it's like a community thing. But I was actually embarrassed. Like I had internalized embarrassment about it. And it's only now that I have my own children that I'm like, hello, aunties, come and help out. You know, like it's like a it's a completely, it shifts your lens and many um, ethnic, you know, uh, cultural groups, they, they have the sense of communities to, to support mental health and well-being. And I'm just thinking about the idea that many of our students now who would, when they are being pushed out and left out and erased in the curriculum in their classrooms, how they could turn to community to support their, you know, tethering <laughs> mental health and how that has also been taken away as a result of the pandemic. Yeah. Like that's something that as you were speaking, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I never even um, thought about that, right? So we've got like this, we are, we're taught to feel ashamed of our communities in many cases and ashamed of the way that our communities operate as wholes. Um, that's detrimental to our mental health. So we can, don't feel like we can access it that way. But then of course there's a very real pandemic that's taking place that's also blocking that ability for us to access when it comes to community. So lots of us to, we, lots of us, lots of work for us to be doing in terms of that extra support that we should be doing as opposed to pulling away from that additional support as you'd, you mentioned is sometimes, you know, being used like it's a pandemic, we can't do this work. Like, of course you could do the work. You're the educator in the classroom. You're getting paid very good, healthy salaries in order for us to do this work. And it's a much more joyful, work when we do it with our students and we build that community that microcosm within our spaces and, and really can respond right it, it brings the joy back to the work um i'm just wondering so in terms of I'm looking at our time and i knew this would happen because uh because of who's on this panel but uh just working with um Jennifer, you, what, what, for our educators who are looking to support in schools, there are lots of programs and things that are out there. What have you seen that works within our schools to support uh, mental health in a decolonized way? 
Yeah. Um, well, I think that in a very specific decolonized way, that's taking some time. Right. I, I haven't seen a lot of school systems currently um, that are, um, how should I say this? In, in, not in the non-private sector <laughs> really working it. But what I have been finding in my own research and speaking to colleagues trying to do this work in the education systems is really looking at a few factors. One of them for me is ACEs. Um, I, I don't know if that's something, the ACEs score, looking at um, Dr. Nadine, uh, Nadine Burke Harris. Um, she is the current Surgeon General of California, which is a really big deal. And in her work working with youth in Bayview Hunters Point in California um, in a predominantly like Black and Latinx area, um, they've really started to look at how childhood trauma ends up increasing the risk um, for like leading causes of death um, for U.S. So it affects brain development, immune system, hormones, even the way that our DNA is transcribed and read. So we know that children who have high ACEs score, also which is known for adverse childhood experiences, yeah. end up having um, a shorter life expectancy and less all around health. So right off the bat, part of what I'm helping some schools begin to do in New Jersey and New York City is to incorporate um, an ACEs sort of, not study, so to speak, but a qualitative study where we're not just doing numbers, but we're asking the community, what do you guys need? What, what would be helpful? Number one, childcare, we hear that more than ever, right? Even for families, when it comes to school and checking homework, and as you were just saying, Cheryl, like all the reasons why family need more support. Um, so I think that the ACEs is a nice place to start, but the next place I would say is asking students what they actually need, right? I find that universities, middle schools, elementary, they're bringing like million dollar consultants in and some of that money could be utilized to actually support the community and the families that need it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> no shade, but I mean, it, it's just like, uh, I'm not gonna even go off on a tangent on that, but. I will say um, that the people know what they need. And that is another way, whether or not we're black or brown administrators, you know, that is another way that we have internalized whiteness, right? That is another way that we have not lovingly decolonized some of our thoughts um, around who is an expert and who knows better. So instead of a needs assessment, right? Why don't we ask communities what they need, impacted communities? How are they suffering? What would you need? Um, what kind of support do you need at home in working with your children and helping them do their schoolwork? And are you concerned about your children? Are you concerned to, to talk to them about suicidality or depression or anxiety? Um, there are massive rates, right? Of ED, like eating disorder, right, issues in school systems, um, all genders, right, uh, and non-genders, we're seeing an increase and a rise. Um, we're also seeing massive rates of depression and anxiety. And in, as you beautifully pointed out in the beginning, Cheryl, COVID is just another layer of trauma on top of already impacted communities, you know? So um, I think that it is also really crucial to talk to the communities, not at the communities, but talk to the communities. And when we talk about like really bringing education into the school systems, what I have found to be very helpful once you get an understanding of what the students are seeing. Um, and of course we have to ask questions like, you know, what is the number one concern from your friends? How would they identify this as a concern? You never say like, what is your concern? Because most adolescents are gonna be like, oh no, I'm bored. I'm not talking to you about this adult. Not all, but many. Um, so I think it's really important to dig then into that place of, okay, this seems to be a concern according to these youth. They're, they're saying that they want more information around depression, around anxiety, and that's what I see the most as well. Um, and underneath all of that is trauma, right? Mm -hmm. So what I would say is everything needs to be trauma-informed, including our teachers. 
Yeah. Um, and teachers, I am not blaming you in any way, shape or form. Um, I'm going to hold the systems accountable that are not making the space, that are not providing the funding, that are not providing the time off for teachers, A, to deal with their own burnout, to deal with their own overwhelm, their own capitalism fatigue. I can't imagine, especially now during COVID, right? Try, attempting to teach, I mean, y'all are my heroes, like attempting to teach youth that are home, that are trying to like, like, nobody wants to focus again with the reparations, right? Like we need to call a moratorium on like work and labor and learning at this time. I mean, imagine, I know that I'm being a little bit whimsical here, but what would that look like in, in my fantasy world to have had six months to a year where people like teachers have a time to, 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 to separate, to pull back, to not do things the way that we have done them, which is every day from 8.30 or nine o'clock till four, this is what we're gonna do. So I say this to say that our systems are not trauma informed, right? They think that a training or a workshop or paying half of whatever for a consultant to talk about trauma informed work and trauma informed teaching is enough, it's not. And with all due respect, I've also seen a um, great many teachers, um, you know, needing a little bit more of the hands-on. So the training or the workshop may be one part of the umbrella, but the other part is, are they getting compensated and are they receiving consultation, right? Can I need to bring in case examples, right? I wanna talk about little so-and-so and I wanna talk about how they come in and they're oppositional with me and it drives me nuts, but then what are better ways to deal with them because I know they're dealing with the death of their father or the incarceration of their uncle or the death of their older brother. Does that make sense? So I, I really think that we also need to focus on treating our people better that are serving us, treating our teachers better. So that that way that can also role model and trickle down into the youth that they are serving. Um, and, and one of the last things I will say to this is that just talking about depression means nothing to some of our youth, right? Like what are the symptoms? Like, what does that look like? You know, having trouble coming out, getting out of bed, um, wanting to do your chores, haha, -ha, <laughs> or knowing that you have to do your chores, but having no energy to do it, or feeling irritable. I see this all the time in my teenagers. Their depression and their trauma really gets communicated and amplified with ir in irritability and arguments sometimes, or shutting down completely. I'm good, leave me alone, closing my door, don't wanna eat, I'm all right. So a lot of us don't know what's going on with our, our kids, you know? So I think it is really, really crucial that A, we look at the ACEs, we look at trauma, we look how trauma has had a role, and we also incorporate trauma-informed principles. And then with that, take care of our teachers to make sure there is a sense of community consistently being facilitated among colleagues, among teachers, and providing formal opportunities and time for teachers to talk through and process difficult events, right? Um, and these may be, these may include designated leaders or mentor teachers like Cheryl and others who can provide support for other classroom teachers. Um, yeah, I can keep going on about this. Um, but, but lastly, I will say is, you know, mindfulness and art pockets. Like, I, I don't know about y'all, but in the States, like they're taking away phys ed, they're taking away art classes. So I would highly recommend that we think about ways to continue to add drama therapy, art therapy. Hey, I do basketball therapy. Sometimes if I'm pulling a youth out, I'm like, oh, I got my ball with me. You want to play? And they're like, I knew you were tall, but I didn't know you played ball. And I'm like, well, I'm not good, but I'll, let's talk and play, right? Around the world, I get to ask a question, you make a shot. Like, I think we need to think outside of the box of what is therapeutic and what is healthy for our youth and our teachers. I think, I think um, Jennifer, you make um, really good points about the idea that, uh, you know, trauma-informed practices, the number one thing is, one of the number one things is, is the idea of relationships. And, and you speak to that beautifully, the idea that we need to build those relationships with our students, ask them, what do they need? We need to build those relationships with the community to say, how can we work together in conjunction? How can I best you know, represent and bring community into my classroom in a way that is meaningful to your child and to our child collectively that we are helping to nurture and grow and take care of? 
you know, and um, Dr. Kristen McLeod, I remember um, she put together like this little pyramid in this workshop that I went to, where she, a workshop where she talked about trauma informed practices and social emotional well being was like one of the highest levels of cognitive regulation, self regulation, like above, you know, academic. Uh, regulation in terms of the mental capacity that it takes. And of course, underlying all that was relationships. You know, if you don't have the relationships, the learning doesn't happen. The self-regulation doesn't happen. The self of identity doesn't happen. And so, you know, all these things are missed when we don't build those relationships and start with centering our students and their identities, right? Um, also, Dr. Janine Jones, she talked about the idea that um, many of us miss cues when it comes to Black children when it comes to Indigenous children, when it comes to Asian children, because many of the, I guess, classical manifestations that we look for as, you know, somebody who's experiencing depression, somebody who's experiencing trauma, we take it again from a colonial lens. So many of these things that we've been historically looking for are for a white child. They are not for many of the children that are in front of us and we're missing this. And so, you know, where is the time that we take to educate ourselves? So I have that piece of knowledge now. Good for you, Saima. What are you going to do with that? Because now I got to go teach my chemistry, my biology, my, you know, this committee, that committee, this community organization. Where is the time for that to decompress that, to process it and to, to, to work as a community of educators and healthcare providers to really think about, so what does this mean for our practice within the classroom? Yeah. So where is all that, right? Right. I'm looking at the time. It's eight thirty one. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay, okay. We're gonna we're gonna draw to a very quick close. Just two quick things. Um, this is not so quick, but it, it, it can be quick. Um, so talking about trauma informed practices and social emotional regulation, our government has uh, recently proposed a new curriculum for mathematics, where we are linking social emotional learning formally within the curriculum of mathematics. So it's something that we can now evaluate in the context of math. Um, you know, some people are loving it because there's formal recognition that social emotional learning is something that's so critical and important to the well-being of the whole child. And there are some that are kind of like, hold on a second, have we really thought through this in a proper way? Um, why don't we start with you, Cheryl? What are your thoughts on, um, on that? Oh, wow. Oh, where shall I start? Um, yeah, while social emotional and math looks great on paper, one has to ask themselves, you know, who was at the table and on the menu when they revised that new math curriculum? Mm -hmm. Because obviously I do not believe it was delivered um, from a race equity lens and a standpoint. Because we know 80% um, of the province teachers are white. We know that's basically the makeup of, of school boards. So we know those are the teachers delivering the bulk of that social emotional piece. And we know that those are the teachers. We also have uh, anti-Black um, racism within other racialized communities too. You have to remember that as yeah. well, very much so. Um, and, you know, the delivery concerns me because it will be through their lens, which is not trauma-informed, their lens, not culturally responsive, and their lens with bias. So they will be assessing and monitoring our students, and that deeply concerns me. Um, with regards to how they assess what they assume mo social emotional learning should look like when they have no understanding that within uh, across the cultures, uh, you know, students react to trauma differently in different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and their emotions are either bottled up because we are taught when we go to school, don't tell the teacher your business because they're worried that CAS may turn up on their desktop for the slightest of things because we know that CAS has a habit of taking our black and indigenous children and which is like taking our enslaved African ancestors children away and the same as placing our indigenous children in residential schools so they've just reformed that into CAS so, you know, we have to really look at that standpoint and it, it concerns me. The whole mindfulness and the zones of regulation has always been a big problem for me because, you know, who is it really for? The teacher or the students? You know, because you see all these things that they're doing mindfulness and deep breathing and they'll post it on social media. And when you analyze and look at the teacher, more times than not, the teacher doesn't reflect the student body. And it's their lens that they are teaching it from. And it's their lens that they're assessing it from. So 
it deeply concerns me um, how the new curriculum is really going to fully unfold without it's just another layer of racism that we have to navigate basically because mm -hmm. now we're going to be assessed on how we feel and how we react and how we should feel and how we should react um so i have i have deep deep concerns around that um and i'll, I'll basically leave it there thank you thank you dr mullen any opinion I think Cheryl nailed it. <laughs> um, I, I just want to add as a way to uplift what has already been said, um, that I think that there's a lot of structural advantage. Yeah, there's a lot of structural advantage for the very large percentage of white teachers and this white frame to continue to apply unconscious or consciously, right? Microaggression or micro assault or macro ones onto students and I dare say even other colleagues, right? How often I would imagine you're always, I, I mean, I experience it myself through colleagues, you know, being on elevators and a colleague saying, oh, is it your first day of class? And I'm like, yep, yep it is. And they're like, oh, when are you gonna graduate? And I'm like, oh, I, I'm, I'm teaching this class. Like, like what, <laughs> like, like, I'm sorry, no. I'm teaching multicultural 605 for counselors, right? But, um, <laughs> you know, just the level of degradation and overwhelm that plays out. And as I was looking at um, some of the, the modules, all I kept thinking to myself is, who are holding the teachers accountable for some of this? Like who are holding them accountable? What is that structure in the criteria for that? And here, this is just another way that we're gonna overdiagnose and pathologize very healthy, understandable reactions to this world feeling out of control, particularly, right, for marginalized people. So if there's already all this anti-Blackness, what's going to happen when a young black person you know gets pissed and just kicks a garbage can you know i'm not saying that they get to like harm someone else but the rage is expended is just like oh f this i'm done i don't want to do this and then that gets pathologized so to me in my mind as a psychologist and someone who worked and trained as we all do in poor communities and poor black communities what i would say is the school system often becomes the beginning pipeline as we know into the criminal justice system right so a lot of the kids that i've seen then when i worked in juveniles and upstate as we call it often what i see is that they have oppositional defiant diagnosis mm -hmm. right or they're they're having some sort of behavioral diagnosis. But what is the root of the behavior? It only seems that we engender that empathy when we're talking about lighter skinned or white children, right? And I would like a lot more of that empathy and that understanding and that curiosity also engendered to our darker bodied children. Um, so yeah, I think it's dangerous. Um, I would agree with Cheryl, like who was in the room and who was at the table and who wasn't at the table? Right. I would bet a lot of parents were not at that table <laughs> and a lot of parents that were black and indigenous ancestry. So um, it concerns me. That's what I would say. Be concerning. And it doesn't feel trauma informed from my angle and my lens. Right. Yeah. I mean, also, like, you know, it's kind of rolled out and um, I'm just going back to, you know, training and frameworks, I don't know that there were some fulsome conversations around that. I, uh, I, I think that for me, uh, I was very torn and part of me, uh, what, what part of my, one of my thoughts were, were so now we have, um, we know that bias already plays into the way that we evaluate our students. And now we're doing, it, it's like another double layer of now here's another way that we can allow bias to impact our students. And this time it's gonna be on record in terms of a numerical assessment or an alphabetical assessment on the capacity of this child. So maybe they're math whizzes, but maybe the way that they're, express, ex, they're expressing frustration having to do with math or maybe having to do with life or maybe having to do with racial trauma, because that is a very real sense of trauma, um, which you're surrounded with you know, all the time. There is no escape. Um, and now as a result, they're not gonna be valued for their mathematical thinking and contribution. Now it's going to be, you know, I don't, you know, it's a, okay, all right. I just thought, you know, as the experts, I would just throw it out there and 
um, see what you had to say. Um, Cheryl, did you want to add anything to this? Maybe briefly, because I know that we're heading towards the end. Um, Jennifer mentioned the school to prison pipeline with regards to the police within schools. And um, I just want to give a shout out to Advocacy Peel, uh, an amazing group who are activists, activists, ground roots, who actually helped channel and remove, help to support the removal of the SRO officers, the police officers from um, our school board and also to the Dufferin Peel School Board, and they'll be looking at expanding around the GTA. So they've done huge work, unpaid labor, um, several hours of, of committed work to make sure that, um, you know, we, we, we boot out the police from our schools because there's, there's no need to have them there. Uh, so yeah, that was my piece, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you. Oh, I see Sultan. Yes, uh, I feel like a I feel like a helicopter reporter that just comes in and be like, "All right, from the view here, everybody." Uh, I just wanted to say, um, you know, a message was put out to the chat box, letting everyone know that you know to not work in the colonized structure of time and pushing us for time, uh, working within fixed. Uh, periods of time, uh, we'll just wait for a natural end to this conversation. So all of those who are here, all 255 people who are still here, um, I think agree with with that notion. So um, mm -hmm. I wanted to say that, you know, we had some great activity in the chat box, a lot of questions, nothing but affirmations, agreements, uh, provoking questions, unlearning. It was spectacular. Um, the question I would like to put forward from the chat box, and there was quite a few, um, and uh, I appreciate everyone who put, put something forward. I think there's a lot in listening to our panelists. I think there's a lot we're going to unpackage and a lot of learning and action that we ourselves are going to own and we're going to move forward in our way in our context uh, with our realizations from this talk so that has informed some of the questions um I, I have to unfortunately not ask but the one question i do feel this seems very uh actionable and might even present itself tomorrow with some of our uh some of our attendees um and this question comes from ae and it is, uh, how might we respectfully challenge counseling psychology professors who blindly and decisively perpetuate white pedagogies or theories or frameworks and overlook the perspectives and experiences of students who are Black, Indigenous, uh, and those who are uh, people of color? Um, and I'd like to put an editorial in here. Feel free to omit respectfully. I, I would say try and seek out um, a, a practitioner that's culturally responsive. Um, I have issues currently, and I'm just going to say it, um, my board, the majority, of, and with several other boards, um, the majority of the PSSP staff, which is psychology, social work, and speech and language pathology, um, are white. And um, again, uh, they come without, most times than not, the majority without a race equity lens, trauma-informed lens, and they come with their own white gaze and white, uh, white privilege alongside. And I, re I remember in, in a few case conferences in my old role where, you know, black parents were just happy to see me at the table because you, you come into this meeting about your child that is deemed bad. And now you're surrounded and intimidated by a sea of white faces and they'll see the you I always, you know, I can just see the check and they're like, oh, my gosh, there's someone that looks like me, you know, and then working and connecting with them. And, you know, the, they asking, do you not have black psychologists or social workers in the board? And, you know, and then I would help to advocate. And then the white psychologists and the white uh, social workers would get their backs up and offended, centering themselves and their whiteness around why is it that they need? Why do we have to go and ask X, Y, and Z? Why can't I? Well, you're not, I all respectfully, you have the qualifications and training, but that's in the field within whiteness. You know, so, you know, with that part, we have to be very careful and, and a lot of, uh, I'm sure there are some listening online um, where it's very important that they respect that request from the Black, African and Caribbean and Indigenous, um, you know, parent that is advocating for their child and they know what's best for their child and you're not always best for that child. So it's a matter of let's seek out someone that will best serve because at the end of the day, it's the child that we need to center not you. And I'll leave it there. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I would also say, because I, I, and maybe I misheard wrong, but I also heard this piece there around like a professor, right? And like not including something, um, but I could have got it wrong. But what I keep thinking to myself is, um, I, I understand this. 
I have gone through it. Like Cheryl, like I can feel that activation in my body because the majority of my education was that way. Yeah. <laughs> and I was not given, um, you know, great things to read that were inclusive of any of our people. Um, so what I would say is ask for what you need, caveat, not alone. You know, do I would not do it by yourself because we know that there's a power differential there's a hierarchy there. Um, and, and it just may make you feel unsafe, you know? So I would say, is there another student? Is there another colleague? Is there someone else there in the classroom? And a number of you, not two, <laughs> a, a few of you, do you even have some white co-conspirators and accomplices that can be the mouthpiece to say, hey, and I know I made an assumption that that person was not white, but they might've been, you know, um, they, they can say, hey, we need to hear a little bit more of this as well because of all of these reasons, because we're dying, <laughs> because um, we are looking at coloniality and we're in a post-colonial society, but what does that mean and what does that look like? Um, I've had students not just bring up my work, but other work from people across media and say, hey, look at this article, look at that. Can we talk more about this? Can we talk more about Ken Hardy's work in counseling? Can we talk more about Dr. Joy DeGruy Leary's work? Like Nancy Boyd Franklin, can we start bringing in some of these black and South Asian in, um, educators that will continue to expand our breadth of knowledge, right? Like whiteness does not get to claim our education. We also need to decolonize the F out of of white pedagogy because it is harmful and violent. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Thank you. All of that. <laughs> so, um, um, I have more questions, but I know um, I'm going to be respectful of the timelines over here of, of our panelists as well as our audience. Um, we know that Sultan and I and the planning committee, when we were initially, you know, thinking about this topic, we knew that this was just be a conversation opener. We knew that many of us would be left with a lot more wonderings and questions and areas to explore and continue to learn and, you know, think about how, what do we do with this? What do we do with this gift of knowledge, the privilege of this knowledge? How do we take this and mobilize it into action? So um, as we close, if, if we could just take some extra time, sorry, um, for our panelists to just share with us, where do we go from here? How do we continue our learning? Because we know that this is just an opener. For us um, and whoever would like to start. Okay. Oh, right. What, what a great, what a great closer. Um, well, number one, I would say is to find ways to internally decolonize um, and have compassion for oneself in the ways, um, particularly um, you know, Black, Indigenous, Caribbean identified people, like have some compassion with the ways that we have been collectively socialized to internalize whiteness, right? Down to colorism, right? Um, who is smart? Who gets to take up space? Down to looking at, um, you know, the ways that we view each other and the ways that anti-blackness continues to be perpetuated even within the black and brown communities. So one of the first things I would say is start taking a look inside before we start putting our lens externally, start to learn and understand that um, as Nipsey Hussle said, this is a marathon, right? This isn't <laughs> this isn't a one-stop shop. There ain't no workshop that is gonna get you decolonized, honey. It don't work like that. Like this is a process, right? This is a process. And um, I know that I'm still in this process and I feel like I've been doing this work for about 15 years, not naming it this, but undoing like and it's another door and another box and another box and another box and and allow yourself to get called in i feel like we change most when we're uncomfortable right not unsafe but uncomfortable so go to your growing edge and be willing to not know particularly those of us with more advanced degrees, be willing to be the newbie, be willing to go to community organizations and activists and take workshops 
and give your money. Learn from the grassroots people doing this work, sleeping on floors, supporting each other. That's mutual aid. That's support. You know, so I would say be kind, be compassionate, hold yourself accountable. Let people call you in. And sometimes we need, may need to be called out. Sometimes if we're doing harm, we may need to be called out. And before you get defensive and shut down, look at who is being impacted by your actions and, and, and really take a long, hard look at yourself. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be accountable. Hold yourself accountable. Mm -hmm. Thank Loved you. all of that. It, it's true. We've got to look at, at ourselves first before we can even attempt to go outside. Because many of us hold bias. Many of us are still conflicted. Many of us still have trauma. Many, you know, many of us have, you know, internalized co colonialism, you know, impacted within us. Um, I'd also say, you know, go to onabse.org, O-N-A-B-S-E, sorry, .org, onabse.org. Also look at the Black Health Alliance um, you know, there, um, also go to, um, advocacy peel on, on Facebook, um, because there are some trauma informed people there behind the scenes, um, to support you, but also, um, I'd say encourage you to spoon feed yourselves knowledge and information. Don't let others spoon feed you because I often I keep seeing people going around gathering others information and taking from uh, the work from others, you know, the heavy labor from others and not crediting but yet using it for their own personal agenda. If you're genuinely interested in decolonizing mental health and education, you'll really do the work. Um, you know, you really just, you know, pull your sleeves up, get on with the work, do a lot reading, connect with people around you, people that don't look like you, you know, to help support your journey, people, you know, that will support your learning and journey towards decolonization. If, if you're truly interested, you'll do the work. If not, it's the usual superficial, let me just add this to my resume and my portfolio and that will help my promotion. And then that's it. So, you know, that's what I'll say from there. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mullen at, at, at Decolonizing Therapy. You have a beautiful website, right? It's Decolonizing Therapy. And I've, I, I've been very, I've been fangirling you from afar, truth be told because I've been watching your webinars and following your articles. And so this is such a privilege and honor to have you here sure. and Cheryl, I mean, you walk the walk and, um, and it's, it's, an inspir it's an inspiration to see um, how you enact the decolonization process um, in your classrooms and working with students and you inspire on a daily um, at all different levels. So thank you so much for the two of you. Thank you so much to our audience. Thank you so much to Sultan uh, for ensuring that we are going through smoothly on the internet. <laughs> And over to you, Sultan, any closing remarks? Yeah, I just want to thank, uh, at the highest point, we had 360 live streamers, but um, at the current moment, we have 151. Thank you so much for hanging in with us. But the interesting thing is we've already had 730 replays back. So people are chiming in even after the live stream has commenced and either catching up or starting on or passing as someone and someone's watched a little bit and it will return back to it. So it'll be really interesting to see um, how many viewers we have in, in even a couple of days. Uh, I wanted to let all of our all of those who registered and came through, thank you so much for coming and uh, know that we will be sending a copy of this recording to you uh, hopefully in about a week, but then it will also be posted up on our site. I would like to give uh, a a special big up and respect to Farah Rahmatullah, who is uh, the colleague of Simon and I, who is live tweeting right now on the Fessy Twitter account. So much respect to the live tweeting. That is a job on its own. So thank you, Farah. I'd like to myself as well, thank our panelists. Um, I'm just elated to be in the same digital room as you. Uh, if there's any, if for whatever COVID has brought to us, um, I am a better person for having be in digital rooms and have digital opportunities like this to be in your presence and learn from you. So uh, on behalf of Simon and I, thank you. Uh, on behalf of the whole chat box uh, and the YouTube world, thank you so much. And everyone, thank you so much for chiming in to Fessy, the third webinar in our series. Have a great night, be well, and see you at the next session. <laughs>